the introduction to HFDXing. So one of the things that um, a lot of us who are really into DXing uh, hope for is that the people that come into this hobby with only uh, with a very narrow focus for uh, using radio out in the bush or uh, maybe some DXing through the internet, uh, various uh, IRLP or DMR or whatever, hopefully we can um, convince them that there's another even more fascinating world of HF DXing. So um, it's, there's a lot to learn in it, a lot to experiment uh, with, uh, but I've found it very rewarding. And so it's, to me, you know, it's the old story where someone is very passionate about something they want to share that joy that they find with other people. And so that's what I'm attempting to do and convince you that, uh, you know, if I was really into fishing and you'd never fished before, I'd want to invite you on a fishing trip to, to get you hooked, so to speak. So the same thing is um, kind of what I'm trying to do here with, with um, DXing um, because it's not something that you can rely on. It changes every day. It changes season to season and year to year. And so it's, it's something that um, takes basically a lifetime to learn. I'm still learning. So uh, with that, um, tonight's outline, what it is, what's DX, how do I start if I want to, uh, what are the various modes and goals, uh, regions of the world, station set up. Looks like a lot of stuff I'm going to cover, but it's really not that much because I'm not going to say a whole lot about most of these things. I just want to give you a little taste of, of what's involved here and a few ideas. I don't want to overload you with information. So starting with uh, what it is, it's different things to different people, which sounds like a political answer. Um, to me, it's, it's talking to people on the other side of the world, far away. Uh, if I go on CW on a band and I say, I start sending CQDX, CQDX, or I can even say it vocally as I just did, uh, CQ 20 meters, CQDX, uh, what I'm tending to mean or what I hope to mean is that I don't want to talk to anybody in Canada or the United States or North America. I'm trying to get outside uh, of that uh, unfortunately, a lot of, especially Americans, don't know what that means when someone says CQDX. <laughs> and I'll get, uh, I'll get people from California uh, or uh, New York or whatever calling me uh, when, if you think about it, other, if I just called CQ, then they, that would be all-inclusive. I've heard Americans calling CQDX and other Americans calling them. And so... Um, I, I don't know that they teach that in the U.S., that when someone wants to work DX, they, they want to work somebody far away, not next door. Um, but in, in, in another way, if you're on 80 or 160 meters, which are long wavelengths, and you're up against some uh, interesting conditions, you might think that working New York or the East Coast is, is real DX. Or if you're only running five watts, talking to somebody a couple thousand kilometers away is DX. So it is a relative concept. Um, and, and so it depends on which band you're on, what time of day, what mode you're running, how much power you're running, and where you are. It turns out that Alberta, especially uh, central and northern Alberta, is one of the worst places to work DX on the entire planet. Uh, Calgary is a little better than Edmonton, and Lethbridge is better than Calgary. So the further south you go, especially when you're getting towards salt water and the equator, it gets much, much better. Um, why is DXing fun? <clears throat> well, I tried to state at the beginning that uh, fishing, mountain climbing, carpentry, gardening are fun for the, a lot of people. And they would try to convince you to try those uh, hobbies as well. And maybe uh, you've done that too. So all, all of those things require some knowledge, some tools, learning uh, various skills, 
being creative and uh, being dedicated so that you can get better at it. And as you become better at it, you get more enjoyment out of it. It's like anything else. Um, DXing has its own language like everything else. If you've ever attended a, uh, uh, a meeting on carpentry or mountain climbing, you'll find they have their own language too. Um, but unlike some of those, there's a lot more, I think, unpredictability with DXing, which to me is, is a, uh, a good part of it. Um, people have asked me, why don't you just use Skype? Call somebody in Australia. And uh, well, I would if I knew who to call, but uh, it, it doesn't allow you to dial random numbers uh, very often, especially if it's uh, in the middle of the night at, on, on the other side of the world. <clears throat> okay, so how do I start? I've actually got some homework for you if you've never um, been on HF. And this comes out of a book. I just loaned a, a copy of this to Andre. Um, the most important skill you can have for DXing is listening. It's not just hearing, but learning how to listen. And it's a learned behavior. So if you turn your radio on, <clears throat> Let's say you start at the bottom of 20 meters, 14.000 megahertz. I want you to just start slowly working your way up the dial towards 14.35, which is the end of our ham band. And noting every single signal that you hear, what is it? Is that Morse code? Is that RTTY? Is that PSK31? See if you can identify me. There's probably a lot of stuff you won't know but keep a journal and start listening. And when you work your way up to the top, go back and start again. See if you can figure out which are the stations that are local, that are in North America, and which are the DX. They actually sound quite different, especially, um, well, even voice, I was gonna say CW, uh, you can hear a, a certain tone of, this, of the CW that tells you it's not local, it's not North America. And un until you actually start listening, you won't know that. Some of you have radios uh, or devices that can translate CW into English. Some of the radios are built in, have built in uh, capability to do that now. I have a little QCX QRP five watt transceiver that's uh, like a $60 transceiver and it does that. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that uh, you can start to discover. If it's radio teletype, you can download a free um, teletype demodulation package and it'll start typing out those uh, keystrokes on your screen on your computer and you'll be able to figure out what they're saying. So there's a lot of stuff just to learn how to listen. Now, another thing that you'll quickly discover when you're listening is there's three things that make listening very difficult. It's maybe more than that. It could be your family, uh, could be your cat, but I'm talking about on the radio. And they're referred to as QRM, QRN, and QSV. If you've forgotten your Q signals from the courses and that sort of thing, I'll refresh your memory. QRM is just interference from other stations. You've got two closely spaced stations talking over each other. You'll hear that, especially when the bands are alive and active, or there's a contest on, or there's a de-expedition, which we'll talk about later. So one of the things that separates out the expensive radios from the inexpensive radios is the ability to deal with separating out signals, QRM. I'm not gonna go into those right now, that's a more advanced topic, but uh, especially on Morse code, you have a whole bunch more tools to use to separate out uh, a 400 hertz signal from a 405 hertz signal, let's say. Um, QRN refers to noise, static, ignition noise if you're in a vehicle, uh, from a plasma TV. There's all kinds of sources of QRN and it's growing exponentially as we've talked about. So there's, a, there's more tools on your radio depending on which radio you have to deal with noise. 
And so that is different than QRM because QRM are actually signals that are interfering with each other. Noise is something that is separate from that, generated by something perhaps doesn't even know you exist. Uh, and um, coming from a LED bulb or something that's interfering or, or maybe from your, um, your power supply that's interfering with the station you're trying to, to listen to. And then there's QSB, which is fading. Stations that are far away will fade in and out. And they'll fade in slowly or they'll fade in fast and go away fast. There's different rates of QSB. And there's ways of, uh, of dealing with that as well. So those are the three things that you're going to have to deal with in shortwave radio that's quite a bit different than uh, VHF or UHF FM communications or digital communications. And that takes a lot of listening to get used to that. And it also takes a lot of practice to start using all those things that you actually paid money for when you bought your transceiver that you haven't been using yet, such as the filtering. Should I have a high, high cut filter, a low cut filter? Should I need, do I need a notch filter? Uh, should I have my um, uh, digital notch filter on uh, or digital noise attenuation? Should my, my AGC be fast or slow? You may not know what these things do or what the theory is behind them, but you can still try them. See if it makes it better or not. Play around with those knobs. You can always reset them. So um, see, see what your radio can do to address, especially the QRM and QRN. If somebody's tuning up, uh, which is a very, very narrow signal, right in the middle of a voice, you know, signal you're, you're copying, you can put on your notch filter and tune it to that, that frequency of the, the, the tuner and they're gone and you still hear the voice very clearly. At least you do on my, my uh, transceiver. So there's all kinds of things that you can learn by listening and that's your best and most useful skill. I'm gonna stop right there and ask if there's any questions on listening because it's so important. Okay, here's more on listening. Um, so get a map of the world. It'd be really helpful if you have a, a place on the wall of your, wherever you have your radio room to put a map of the world on it with the prefixes of the countries. Uh, the next best thing is a monitor, uh, but it's so useful to have a physical map because then you're staring at that while you're doing other things. And some of those will, will get absorbed over time. You'll learn, for example, that a VK, oh, that's Australia. Uh, you know, just like we know what VE and VA are. Well, v, VK or ZL right next door, that's New Zealand. So having a map, if you're going to be DXing is so important. And it, it also reminds you how, how, um, how small the world is as far as where our signals can reach. So keep looking at that map. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is to listen to how people contact each other. If you're worried about making contacts, listen to how everyone else does it. If you listen enough, you'll figure it out and you'll say, hey, I can do that. It's no big deal. I can give a signal report. I can tell them that I can barely hear them or that they're booming in 20 over nine. Uh, so listen to how people are talking to each other. If you hear somebody calling CQ, listen, maybe you'll hear somebody answer them. Then what questions are they asked? What information do they exchange? Write it all down, make a note of it, figure out what you would say and suddenly it becomes a lot more familiar and less threatening. Uh, if there's a pileup, now we haven't had many pileups because of the pandemic, but in, in previous years, we'd have people go to um, distant lands, islands all over the place, uh, de-expeditions they're called, and people want to talk to them because it's a rare country. 
we call them countries. They're actually ed entities. We'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, so all of a sudden there's a thousand people calling this one guy. Figure out who's getting through, why? Listen to that. Next, uh, you have to learn your basic cue signals. There's probably about six or eight, maybe 10 that are used 99% of the time. And your phonetic alphabet. One of the things, one of the big sins is to call somebody, I'm talking HF, but even on two meters and not use phonetics because so many letters sound like so many other letters. And then the guy has to repeat it and, oh, did you mean this? Oh, did you mean that? So get in the habit of using phonetics for your call sign. Okay. Um, and I see Mike is posting some maps, lots of maps. That's very good. And some you can print out and some you can order also to post on your wall. Um, I used to have a cork board and I used little red, um, some pins with a red ball on the end to point, uh, stick in the map where I, places that I'd worked. Um, I mentioned about CW, if you don't have a CW reader and you're not a CW person, you can still uh, listen see if you can make out anything. Um, you can pick out one or two letters and look them up, see what they're, if it makes any sense. Uh, there's other things you can do. You can buy peripherals, uh, other equipment to uh, decode CW. Maybe you'll get hooked on it. Um, for If you're using CW or not, you need a good headset. If you're gonna listen, you need to have quiet and you need to be able to have all the signals right there on your on your outside of your ears. So get a good headset. I'm not going to recommend right now. There's a bunch of good ones out there and we can have a session on that if you want. But that's a must. All the contesters I've ever met or real DXers use a headset 100% of the time. Uh, and then the other thing that uh, is mentioned in this uh, DXing book I, I loaned Andre is to get a comfortable chair. You're gonna be spending a lot of time in that chair if you're listening properly. So it's gotta be comfortable or you're just not gonna be sitting there. So there's an old saying I think I mentioned before, the, the brain can absorb what the seat can withstand. So it's, it's, uh, it's an important thing to be ergonomically uh, comfortable. Okay. On to modes. I'm not gonna get into detail on this, but uh, what this slide is, it comes from the RAC, uh, Radio Amateurs of Canada site. And uh, on the top left corner, you've got 160 meters to the bottom right corner is 10 meters. Those are the HF bands. There's nine of them. And if you add in the 60 meter band, there's 10 now. I've never been on 60 meters. I'm not gonna talk about it tonight. Uh, but if anyone wants to talk about it, uh, I'll be happy to learn something. Um, but as far as the other ones, I've, I've got DXCC, which means I've got 100 countries on all but 160 meters. Uh, I've, I'm only halfway there on 160. From a city lot, it's not easy. But it can be done. <clears throat> in fact, there's several people in Calgary who have their DXCC on 160. Uh, but uh, not me. Not yet anyway, I'm working on it. Um, so what this does, this chart shows you the various modes. So red is CW, green is phone, and then there's blue and digital. And there's a little bit of pink or magenta, which is TV, slow scan television. We won't even talk about that. We can talk some other night about that. But basically this is a, what they call a, a band plan which is not officially law. These are suggested, but very, very few people break these sort of uh, soft rules. So if you want to know um, where you can operate certain things, or if you do what I suggest and listen, start at the bottom of a band and tune on the way up, you'll see that these things are pretty much uh, adhered to you won't hear CW very often above where the red is showing on here. So this gives you a guide as to what, uh, what modes you're going to hear uh, in which band, what part of the bands. This is as of December, 2015 and it hasn't changed. 
to my knowledge anyway. So that, and notice on the 30 meter band, which is the bottom left, there's no voice. It's either CW or digital. So some of them, um, and there's no contesting on the WARC bands or WARC bands, which are the 30, 12 and 17 meter bands. So that's good for a lot of people are very upset with contesters taking over a band during a weekend. So um, they can always go to a work band and, and uh, not have to deal with that. Okay. So one of the things, once you get started, it's like anything else, you wanna start collecting. Uh, how good am I or what, what, what am I, um, doing here that I can measure. So there's all kinds of goals for DXing. It's kind of like fishing, you, know, you get a um, award for the biggest fish or the smallest fish or the most fish or whatever. But once you start talking to various countries, you've now worked Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, a few stations in Europe, you say, well, gee, I've, I've got these confirmed now. Uh, how do I get recognized for that? So there are these certificates and plaques. Um, the most sought after is the DX Century Club. This comes from the American Radio Relay League. You talk and confirm a hundred different countries around the world. And you get a really nice certificate, which you pay for. And it costs you 12 cents to confirm each country. <clears throat> so 12 bucks isn't too bad. Um, and then something for the paper to ship it to you. So when you consider how much the radio costs and how many hours you put in and all that kind of stuff, the, the, uh, <laughs> the money is not the issue. Um, some people don't have anything to do with um, these certificates or plaques or whatever. They just do it for fun. A lot of people are into QSL cards collecting. I've got about six or eight shoe boxes full. And that's since 2005. Um, bragging rights, if you have a bunch of friends, you say, hey, did you, uh, did you work that guy last night? Yeah, I just, uh, and by the way, I got a QSL card from this country uh, yesterday. I was a new one, so on. There's something called an ATNO, A-T-N-O. It's an all-time new one. So it's, you've never ever talked to Singapore. Uh, and there he is, and you've finally worked him for the very first time. You can tell somebody, I just got an at no. And if they're a DXer, they probably know what that means. If not, they'll look at you funny. So, um, so that's uh, something that can be fun too. So other people do this to become a better operator, operating through really bad conditions to talk to somebody who's only running 100 watts on an island in the South Pacific can be fun. Uh, the DXCC honor roll. Uh, there's several people around here that uh, in Calgary that are on that honor roll. Uh, I am not. I'm, I'm shy of that. We'll, we'll talk to, about that. I've only been um, really DXing in Calgary since 2005 and uh, it takes quite a while to, to get there on the honor roll. Uh, I don't know if I'll, I'll see that but hopefully someday. And then stamp collecting. When I was a kid, I collected stamps. I still have my album. I don't know how it managed to follow me around the world, all the places I've been, but I still have it. And uh, when you start getting QSL cards from different countries, they come with stamps and you peel them off and then you can save those and uh, put them in your collection. So a lot of, uh, that's another aspect of this that I found is fun. Okay, the DXCC list. So if you're interested in this from the ARL, there's a list, 340 current countries. It changes periodically when there's a new country or a country changes its name or two countries merge or somebody comes out uh, from another country. I think Kosovo is the latest one to be put on the list. Um, but note that they're not necessarily countries. Uh, Alaska and Hawaii count separately. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of the little islands in the Caribbean are separate entities for the DXCC. So it's not as onerous as all, all that to get a hundred. 
in fact, with FT8, I think you could probably do it in, in a few months time if propagation starts to improve. In fact, some weekends with contests, you can probably do it. Now the top 50, they, they actually organize these by uh, popularity and, and they take votes on this and they publish these, uh, the hardest to get. Right now, the hardest to get is North Korea. Uh, the prefix is uh, Papa five. I've never got them, but people, I, I think um, uh, Rich V6AX and uh, LB, uh, Jerry, um, and maybe Ken Olki, I don't know. There was a guy in, in, uh, in North Korea at one point uh, for a few days. I don't know how long ago, at least uh, 10, 15 years ago. I think longer ago than that, actually. And so they got some P5 cards, but since then it's been shut down. There was hope when Dennis Rodman was going over there a few years ago that he'd bring a ham radio uh, set up with him, even though he's not an operator, he'd bring a ham with him. Uh, that never happened. And so getting a card from North Korea is, is not happening anytime soon that we know of. Syria and Yemen war zones, uh, uh, Libya are very hard to get right now, but uh, hopefully those will get sorted out soon. <clears throat> um, as far as the honor roll, you need, I think within 10% of the, um, something like that, or 10 countries of the total number that's available. So I think 331 will get you on the honor roll. My, my total I think is 320, 320 or 324, I'm not sure, something like that. So I'm getting there, but uh, some of them aren't easy, especially like for here, from here, the opposite, the antipode or whatever they call it, uh, opposite uh, lat and long for, for us is somewhere around India uh, Pakistan area. It's very hard from here. But with 100 watts and a dipole for 20 meters, you should be able to get DXCC probably within a year if you work at it. Okay. Well, I've been told that there in the world, there are two kinds of people, lumpers and splitters. And so the, the splitters split the world into a bunch of different ways. Uh, some they call regions, zones, grids, whatever. We're in region two, according to the International Amateur Radio Union, which uh, I won't go into the politics of this, but that uh, we have the president uh, of that in Calgary, and he's been president for a number of years. I think he's in his third term, Tim Allen, V6SH. And that group falls under the United Nations body of the international, uh, I believe it's the International Tele uh, Telegraph Union, which was even older than uh, the IARU. So this is um, the band plans and the allocations of frequencies change by these regions. So just something to be aware of. The ITU sets out these 90 world zones and there are some uh, championships or contests that uh, use these zones. Um, so notice that we're in uh, zone two. Uh, it's that green color and we're separate from the U.S. to our south and to the west, Alaska. So um, there's some like the CQ uh, worldwide uses zone uh, and you can see that uh, there's plenty of zones for that. Um, Actually, that was the IARU championship. The CQ magazine came out with uh, many years ago, 40 zones. This is one of the most bizarre things because we're in the same zone as Texas, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, over half the United States. And yet the propagation, the, the properties of where our signal can be heard in Alberta compared to those in Ontario is just so different that it makes no sense. In fact, you can see that they stack the deck against us. Uh, it's intentional. So um, I'll, I'll be, pretend I'm, I'm being uh, paranoid about it, but it actually works very much against uh, anybody in Alberta winning any of these big contests because of if they're in the CQ worldwide. 
oh well, we'd still do it anyway. And then there's the grid squares. If you've been on FT8, you know about grid squares. This is one of the things we exchange. Typically, it's a, a two letter and two character, or sorry, two letter, two number square, like we're in Delta Oscar 21, DO21 here in Calgary. Um, most of us, I think. And so what they did is they broke up the world into, uh, well, we know it's 360 degrees of longitude and uh, plus and minus 90 degrees of latitude. So they broke it up into, um, into chunks with 18 in each direction. The longitude is 18, 20 degree longitude rectangles by 18, 10 degree latitude rectangles. And they started naming these things in the bottom left of the map. That's a Mercator projection flattening of the of the globe according to a certain mathematical formula and it started with AA and go to AR that's 18 letters of the alphabet and then you go BA in the next column and work your way up to BR and so all the way so all the way to RA to RR so if you're on FT8 and you are looking at grids and you see oh well typically you'll just see C D E and F that's North America and so uh, if you see other Ds, you know it's north and south of us. That's, uh, and there are awards for, uh, for, and certain contests that make use of this. You can plot your grid squares. There's a, um, a free uh, website called qsomap.org and you can upload your grid squares. And this is what I've done. I've now got about 2,200 in my career. So somewhere around there, you can see where uh, nobody lives because there's no green square there or no ham has been before. So if you wanna be really popular, you can go to the middle of the Sahara Desert and set up a, a, a little uh, station and everybody who collects grid squares will wanna talk to you. It's one way to be automatically popular. I'm not gonna talk too much about setting up a station for DXing. All I'm gonna say is that Here's a typical station on the bottom left. It's got a transceiver. It's got an amplifier. Even the amplifier is optional. A tuner, uh, which this guy's using an ex, uh, external tuner. A lot of radios have a built-in tuner. In fact, if you look at the upper box, transceivers in green, antennas on the right-hand side, that's basically the only two pieces you absolutely have to have. The rest is optional although you should have a microphone or a key. Uh, other than that, you could get a linear amplifier. Uh, you could get, uh, low pass filters aren't really in vogue anymore since TV went digital. But in the old days of uh, TVI, you needed one. An SWR meter, a lot of the rigs have that built in now. An antenna switch, something you will definitely need because you'll need at least half a dozen antennas to, to uh, to enjoy the hobby properly. And the old rule is you never, never uh, take down an antenna, you just put up more. And of course you should have a dummy load to make sure your rig is working without interfering with other people. So those are basic elements. We've talked about stations before, but um, you know, getting on the air and doing DXing, you can buy a transceiver for a few hundred dollars. It's going to be good enough for DXing. Um, and even if it's just 100 watts, you can put up a vertical antenna if you don't have much space. Remember to put radials down or put up a wire. In fact, I think that's the next, you know, here you go. Uh, you can put up a, a wire tied from your chimney to a post out on the yard, doesn't even have to be horizontal. Or you can do like Andre did and put up a, uh, a clothesline on top of your roof, uh, which we call a hex beam. And, uh, and, and they actually have directionality and put it on, uh, on a tripod. There are all kinds of ways of getting on 20 meters, which is the money band for DXing. And, uh, or if you can't do that, if you're in a, a condo with, with uh, restrictions there, you can go out in the great outdoors and put up an antenna in a park or something like that find a trunk road in the forest and put up a, a wire and you're on the air, you can run off your car battery for a little while. Okay, 
uh, let's see how I'm doing for time. Oh, I'm kind of getting short. Um, so logging and rig control, um, all I want to say is there's uh, most rigs today, in fact, all rigs today can talk to a computer and you can do all kinds of things. I'm not going to go over all these little points on here, but it, it really helps to have rig control with a computer so that you can post uh, stations uh, on your band map. And I'll show you that here. And you can actually click on them and it'll set your radio. So I use a program, it's free, it's called Logger32. Uh, the top uh, is a pan adapter display. I have what's called LP Pan 2, which uh, I bought years ago, uh, which shows the actual spectrum. Weren't many signals on when I took that uh, picture. But the logging program is key and it, it shows you um, all kinds of things you, uh, that you can look up where the stations are on the left hand side. You can click on one of those stations and it'll set your radio to that frequency and you, hopefully you can hear them and you can call them. Uh, quick review of propagation. Basically what I want to say is there's three main layers, the D, E and F layers. D is closest to earth, F is farthest away. And what those stations are, you see these four antennas there um, on the earth. The one on the far right is the longest wavelength and the one on the far left is the shortest wavelength. And as the wavelength uh, decreases or the frequency goes up, uh, sorry, as, yeah, that's right. Uh, as the frequency rises, your penetration into the ionosphere gets further until finally you go right through it. It could be at 10 meters or six meters or something like that. You're not getting any reflection back to the earth. Well, the ideal one is this guy here, uh, second from the left, he's now at a certain frequency where he's able to bounce signals off the F layer and uh, come back to earth. And that, so that's how DXing works. And so uh, the D layer basically absorbs your signals it's closest to the earth and it's only active during the day. So you won't see low uh, long wavelength signals being propagated during the day. Whereas you will see shorter wavelength or 20 meters, typically 15 meters, 10 meters being, uh, uh, be, you know, they'll be working well during the day. One of the things, uh, most important things I want to leave you with is this idea of gray line propagation. It's not that complicated really, and I want to take a few minutes to explain it because uh, this is something Andre was mentioning earlier before we started tonight, is um, there's a phenomenon that at dusk and dawn that happens every day and uh, um, allows us to have what are called, it's kind of like magic on the radio. It allows us to hear stations, maybe just for five minutes, maybe just for 30 seconds. I've, I've heard a station peak for 30 seconds and then disappear at the gray line. So let me just try to describe this. You don't have to remember what I'm about to tell you, just remember dawn and dusk and you'll be good. But during the day, here's the sun during the day, and this D layer here is closest to the earth and it's got the most densely packed um, part of the ionosphere. In other words, as you get away from the earth, you get fewer and fewer molecules, fewer and fewer atoms, uh, further out you go. So the density decreases with distance. So very few light atoms, light, uh, light molecules around the F layer and a lot more in the D layer. Well, if you're going to get ionization, that means separation from uh, the, the neutral uh, molecule, the sun's UV rays have to bake this layer uh, harder. The D layer has to get cooked harder than the F layer because it's got, it's, it's got more atoms to cook and it filters the sun more as it's going through here. So this D layer heats up during the day and it disappears at night because the sun's not shining over here, there's not enough energy to energize that dense layer. The F layer's not energized at night over here either. But while, if you look at where the, what they call the terminator or the, this uh, time between day and night, it's about an hour long. 
maybe a little more sometimes. Uh, so what happens is if this is dawn, then the, uh, the sun is starting to bake the D layer here. It's starting to form, but it's not fully formed uh, over on the other side. Meanwhile, the, uh, the F layer is seeing the sun earlier and it's already forming. So there's a period there where the D layer is absent, but the F layer is already in existence. So you can actually uh, use the F layer without any absorption of your radio waves. Your radio waves get right through and will bounce off somewhere else. The other opposite happens on the other side when the, uh, at, when the sun's going down, the D layer disappears quickly because the sun's rays here are, are having to go through a lot thicker layer of this denser material. And so it starts to disappear well before the F layer disappears. The F layer is still being charged by the sun because it's further out. So this forms this magic band. And if you look on this, this map, you'll see this band. And so if you're in, if it's your uh, dawn or dusk, you're going to have a lot more DX to work at that that hour. That's why Andre was getting up at 4:30 recently to work, and, and it can be their their gray line, not necessarily yours. It's best if it's both, but it doesn't have to be. It can be one or the other. So um, so that's something to keep in mind. Is a good time to uh, to follow this is. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the logging programs will tell you when their sunset and sunrise are for different countries. You just have to punch in the country name. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so where, where should you be sitting uh, with respect to that, um, that band, to that region, the gray line? Like, do you have to be directly underneath it? You, you know, is it? Uh... Yeah. So the, you're going to find the best DX. Now, I, I forgot to mention that this only uh, uh, happens or is only valid up to about 10 megahertz. So 30 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters, 160 meters. Well, 160 is a bit different. It has its own rules, but 80 through 40 gen or 30 meters generally will really respond to this gray line concept. Above that 20 meters, not so much. But if you're uh, at your dawn or dusk for an hour, like I listen every morning around 9 a.m. Uh, or 8 a.m. right now, uh, because an hour before that to an hour after that on 40 meters, I'm hearing uh, every morning on FD8, Indonesia, Japan, China, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, some of these, because when this lines up, it comes down through here, it's coming back up through here. And if you go to this, I'll click on this now, see if this works. I had, uh, here we go. And this is the current uh, oop, gray line map. And uh, you can see right now, we just passed uh, with this projection, it looks like more, more than a line, it looks like a block of cheese, but we're actually through here. And if you uh, turned your radio on right now, you might be able to work stations in, in, uh, in Asia through here, most likely. That's where the path would, would lead you. So the best thing for us is, is to, um, to be on during uh, an hour before and after sunrise and an hour before and after sunset. And that would, that would be our prime time for DXing. And that changes throughout the year because of the seasonal changes. Does that answer your question? It, it does, thanks. Okay. So this is an important thing. You don't have to remember the mechanism, but try to remember that this gray line time is very important if you're going to do DXing. Um, kind of running short of time here. I just wanted to make a few more notes here. You can look this up. We'll be posting this on the SASTAR website, but there are times when the bands are open so you, typically you start with the shortest wavelength early in the morning, if all was good and solar maximum, and then you would keep going down to longer and longer wavelengths until you reach 160 in the middle of the night. That's typically how the bands operate. 
Uh, and then through the solar cycle, all I'll say is that right now, because we're far from the solar peak, the solar maximum, 10 meters isn't open very much, if at all. Uh, whereas it will be in a few years or even less than that, hopefully we get some good um, solar activity. That, that farthest uh, layer of our F layer will become ionized and act as a mirror eventually instead of our signals going out into space on 10 meters. And when 10 meters is good, it's amazing. With a five watt rig, you're talking to uh, Japan on FM. I mean, it, it can be really that good with not much of an antenna. Um, and 160 is usually the best at the bottom of the cycle where you have the least amount of solar activity. The sun is very quiet. There are DX windows on the bands, just something to note that uh, uh, like everything else, it has its place. So it's usually around the bottom of each band um, is where you are most likely to find people looking for other people for DX. So for example, on 20 meters, if you're on CW, 14.000 is the bottom of the band. The first 25 kilohertz is where you'll find most of the DX. Um, on sideband, 14.190 to 14.200. Also note that um, we have an advantage being in Canada with our band plan. We can work DX below 14.15. The Americans can't go below there with their voice. So I'm talking about voice communication, you upper sideband. So I will talk to people in Europe quite often um, or South America at 14140 or 130. In fact, I have a weekly sked with a buddy in Ontario and we're on 14127 on Thursday mornings. And so uh, uh, the Americans can't go down there. So we know we're not gonna get bothered. I'm not gonna go through the voice contacts. We're gonna probably set up something how to do that. The expeditions. Uh, so typically a, a group will go to a, a, a piece of rock like this or to uh, Navassa Island, which is in the um, Caribbean, uh, Bouvet. They tried to get there a few years ago and failed. This is probably the most hostile environment on the planet uh, near the, uh, in the Antarctic region. And it's halfway between um, south, the tip of South America and the tip of Africa. And in fact, I won't go into the story, but they spent a million bucks on the last attempt and, and never got there. Um, so if you can work one of these guys, you get a, a nice looking card and it counts towards your DXCC and all these other awards and they're just swamped. Uh, so, uh, and they try to work every mode and every, band they can uh, for all these different awards people are trying to get. The one thing that uh, I really need to explain to people, again, this is, uh, this is key for working pileups and de-expeditions in particular, is the concept of split. If you've got a transceiver, you've probably got, um, and it's relatively new in the last 20 years, it's probably got VFOA and VFOB. Um, two different way, two different frequencies. And this is why you would need it. So the way I'll, I'll, I'll explain this is starting out with an analogy with two meters. You know that a repeater listens on one frequency and transmits on another. And the reason we do this is so that we don't all jam up on the one frequency. If we all are on simplex, then, um, only the loudest guy is gonna get through and, and he's gotta be pretty strong to get it wherever he wants. But on two meters, uh, if, if one station's stronger than the other, he's gonna capture the repeater and everybody will just hear him. If you're on a single sideband or CW, AM or sideband, whatever um, HF mode, then you don't have the capture effect like, uh, like two meter FM. So imagine if you're on this little piece of rock in the middle of the Pacific and thousands of stations are calling you at the same time, all on the same frequency and you're on the same frequency as them. Well, nobody's gonna get through. It's just gonna be a mess. So what they do is they transmit 
that DX station will transmit on one frequency and you say, I'm listening five to 10 kilohertz or five to 10 up. So he's listening to a range of frequencies and he's gonna tune around to pick the best and clearest signal he can find and come back to them. Now, if you don't know this and you start trying to reply on his frequency, you're gonna have some very angry people because you're covering up what he's transmitting. And chances are you'll be a lot closer to the other stations that are hearing you better than they're, they're hearing him. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to answer him on his frequency instead of the one he's listening on. So they have what's called the DX cops or the DX police. And they'll say, you idiot, he's, he's listening up. And so um, they, some people just take it upon themselves to be DX cops. And quite often they will ruin the um, ability to hear what the DX station is saying because they're talking over top of him as well. So it gets to be a madhouse. And uh, hopefully people, more people know about split. It's amazing that they don't teach this as part of regular courses, but uh, this is more of a, an advanced topic for when you're ready to try to break pileups, but it's a lot of fun breaking pileups. Finally, some DX aids. There's packet clusters, the reverse beacon network, PSK reporter if you're doing FT8, DX maps, there's an app for Apple that I use, and there's bulletins. The packet cluster, I won't go into too much, but here's a Leave E7CC has something you can subscribe to and it just shows you People are very nice and they say, oh, I've heard this guy in Columbia and he's on 7,004 kilohertz. So it alerts you. DX Maps, if you've never tried it, it's free. Um, go on dxmaps.com and you can pick what band you want and what modes you want and you'll see who's talking to whom at that moment. So you'll see what bands are open. PSK Reporter. You can turn on the gray line, I did that. You can see I was on uh, 20 meters uh, here with FT4 and I was being he heard in Europe and you can see that uh, the gray line is working because they're, they're, I'm not in the gray line but these guys are within the hour, or pretty close to an hour within the, the uh, uh, sunset in Europe. Reverse beacon works for Morse code primarily and, and uh, RTTY. You can uh, select the uh, bands you wanna see. It comes out in different colors and then you can see who's spotting and what, what, uh, what stations have been spotted, what uh, speed they're going, 14 words a minute, 24 words a minute and so on. Some of these uh, CW readers, you need to tell them what the speed is that you're listening to. And this is a great way to find out. This is a free uh, app for my, iPad and again it tells you and you can sort you can look for just 20 meter stations or CW or sideband or whoever all kinds of stuff and then uh, there are DX bulletins and uh, here's a bunch of tips for success which I won't go through for the sake of time but uh, the one point I will make is talk to DXers ask lots of questions and you'll find out a lot of stuff that's what I've done Okay, I am going to uh, ask for questions, if there's questions, and then we'll take a little break and then I'll talk about QSLing, which isn't nearly as long a presentation. Any questions? Sure, I've got one. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Jerry, early on in the presentation, you said there are ways to deal with QSB or fading. What, what, do, you, what do you do? I've, I mean, encounter it all the time and I never quite know what to do other than to fiddle with my CFO. Good question. So QSB, there's uh, basically a path difference between your antenna uh, uh, and when the incoming signal is uh, changing sort of angles with respect to your antenna. One of the ways is to use two antennas to phase them. So there's uh, a way of doing that. Um, another one is called diversity uh, tuning. And I believe that that can help as well where you have two separate receivers. And so um, 
I know there's an SDR play, I think that has two separate receivers that allow you to uh, tune slightly off frequency one and the other, and you can combine them uh, with your headphones. And so that can also help with, uh, with QSB. But it's, it's not an easy one. In fact, um, a lot of the contests I've done, especially CW, I'll hear the first part of the call sign and miss the second part, or I'll miss a, just one, one character because of a fast QSB. And it's very aggravating. And it's something that I've, I've not really solved myself very well. Okay, any other questions? Jerry, maybe one here there. So this split mode, uh, can you use it uh, during contest or it's not allowed usually? Because it seems to be a good idea there. Well, that's a good question because in contest you want there to be split because obviously there's a station that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a multiplier and uh, thousands of stations are calling all at once, but it's very bad form or it's considered bad form to go split in a contest. So you're not supposed to do it. I've heard it a few times. And I've heard people ask, will you please go split? And, uh, and, and they say, I can't do it. The problem is that the bands are already so congested. There's nowhere to really listen because now if you go split, you're interfering with, if you're a voice station five to 10 up, um, you're taking up more bandwidth than you're really supposed to. But it, for a de-expedition where nobody else is on the, on the band right now, you can be at uh, 14,190 or 14.2 and listening all the way up to 14.25 and no one will care because uh, they all wanna work that station. There's plenty of other band, but during a contest, you're really not supposed to. All right, that's good. So one more question uh, about the gray line. So is there any point in facing the antenna along a gray line? Like, would you get propagation along yes. the gray line? Yes. Or you, you will still face the antenna where you want to actually communicate to? If they're in a gray line and you catch them. Well, if, if it's your gray line and the, the, the gray, you can point, let's say that the line is going 10 degrees east of north. Uh, and following that around the world, then you can point in that direction mm -hmm. if you have a directional antenna and you'll hear the gray line that's following that path around the world. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but if you're trying to work somebody else on their gray line and it's not yours, then you point at them. Okay, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's amazing when you start listening at gray line time, all of a sudden these stations out of, come out of nowhere and they, you start to hear them weak and then they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then all of a sudden they're like next door. And then 10 minutes later, they're gone. Yeah, that's what I tried on the weekend indeed. But uh, they didn't, they, I could hear them, but they somehow couldn't hear me. The propagation was not very good, uh, the direction, I guess. There's another thing, it's called a skewed path. And what happens is during a magnetic disturbance, because we're so far north, the, uh, the aurora and things can affect us. And so we're trying to work Europe and normally we would point over the North Pole. Uh, but because our path would be blocked by the aurora, we actually have to point further south, we point east. And sometimes the path will work. They'll just be able to hear us because it's kind of bent uh, bending towards the north a little bit, but mostly east. But if we aim towards them and the great circle route, it's not going to work because it's over over the pole and, and the aurora is killing us. It absorbs the signals. Lots to learn. <laughs>